Tattoos were illegal in 1961 up until 1997. Do you know the reason for the tattoo ban? Today we're not only going to go over the ban, but we're also going to go over a few of the tattooers that were working at the time and how they tried to fight it. Man, I am amped to do this episode. I've been waiting a while to do this. It took a lot of research, but I'm here for you guys and I'm stoked to do this. I hope you're just as excited as I am. In an earlier episode, we covered the Bowery and also some of the legends that were located in that area. It's been said that the Moskowitz brothers were the last tattooers in the Bowery. But where did the artists go after the Bowery? They scattered in a multitude of different places in New York City, but there were a select few that wound up in Coney Island. Pull up a chair, grab a tasty beverage, and let's kick this off. We're gonna dive into the post-Bowery years and pre-New York City tattoo ban. We searched through books, articles, magazines, even some video clips to get you information on Coney Island tattooing. We're gonna talk about the artists that made this a happening spot from the 1950s into the early 1960s. For those that are not familiar with the area of Coney Island, we're gonna give you a little bit of context just so you can catch the vibe. We're gonna go back real quick and talk about how it started. Coney Island was bought, and we're gonna use that term loosely, folks, by the Dutch from the Lenape Indians. Then it was bought by the English from the Dutch. Then it's gonna take us to the early 19th century where Coney Island really started to blossom. In the early 19th century, wealthy New York families would go to Coney Island to cool off because of the ocean breeze. It wasn't long before amusements and other areas started to get developed. In the middle of the 19th century, it went from wealthy citizens to the average citizen that was looking to escape the heat of New York City and the tenements that were being built. Now in 1874, one of the first roller coasters in the world shows up on Coney Island. This was essentially the start of how we know Coney Island as of today. It's a boardwalk area for amusements, restaurants, bars, and nightlife. Here on the East Coast, we're used to seeing boardwalks, Jersey Shore, Coney Island, even down South, Delaware, Virginia. So this is a common thing here on the East Coast and also out on the West Coast where we talked about the pike, which you can catch here if you want to see that. Coney Island became home of the Cyclone, Nathan's Hot Dogs, and Beachgoers. Until this day, it still operates as an amusement park and it still holds one of the greatest hot dog eating contests ever known to man at Nathan's World Famous Hot Dogs. Not a huge hot dog fan myself, plenty of you guys out there are. But we're not here for history lessons, right? We're here for tattoos. So today we're gonna give you a couple quick hits of history on some of these tattoo artists that were around in Coney Island. In my opinion, these artists deserve and will hopefully get their own standalone episodes. There is a main cast to this story though, and the most likely start will be tattoo artist Max Pels, or he was commonly known as One-Eyed Max. Not a lot of information can be found on Max, but I tried to do my best to dig up some information for you guys. We know you tattoo crazy maniacs out there love to get your little bit of history on, so here we go. Max was a light heavyweight prize fighter. He lost his vision in his left eye during a prize championship fight with Maxie Rosenblum. Max tattooed from around the 1930s up until the 1960s. Eddie Funk, known as Crazy Eddie, or later to be known as Philadelphia Eddie, said that Max played a pivotal role in him learning how to tattoo at the very beginning. Matter of fact, he sold Eddie his first tattoo setup. Max would eventually sell his shop to Junior Calentano in 1954. Now Junior winds up being a pretty amazing tattoo artist himself. Now there was another tattoo shop right around the corner from Max, and his name was Brooklyn Blackie. He was also known as the Electric Rembrandt. Now Blackie started his career in the Bowery with Charlie Wagner, who we also did an episode on. Check that out. He would also stop by Jack Red Cloud's shop after Charlie Wagner would close and try to sit and learn from Jack Red Cloud. But Jack Red Cloud's was not real good at giving up information and was very well known for not giving up information. I guess you could say it was the precursor to gatekeeping. <laughs> Had to throw that one in there. He had a fear that you would become better than him and actually put him out of business. Jack was known to say, I can't tell you, but I can sell you. 
Now Blackie has credited Jack with teaching him how to shade properly, which was one of the most important parts of tattooing as far as Brooklyn Blackie is concerned. So I guess Jack Red Cloud actually did give up some information to Blackie at some point, right? Now Blackie was tattooing on Sand Street at the time when another tattoo artist named Sailor Don stopped in to see him. He wanted Brooklyn Blackie to come up to his shop and join him. The problem was Sailor Don was already partners with Max Pels. Come to find out there was an argument between the two and he wound up telling Max Pels to get out of his shop. Now in 1949, Brooklyn Blackie buys the shop off of Sailor Don and he had that shop up until around 1960. Now it's said that Brooklyn Blackie had the only real tattoo shop in Coney Island, meaning it actually had front windows and a door, you know, like an actual storefront. Because you see, the other artists that worked in the area actually worked out of makeshift booths. Now there is a reason we went immediately from Max to Brooklyn Blackie. Max essentially had the first shop on Coney Island, but it was really Blackie who wound up breaking in a lot of future legends. Blackie broke in Tony the Pirate Cambria, the Greco Brothers, Philadelphia Eddie, Coney Island Freddy, Mike Colantano, who then went on to break his brother Jimmy in. Jimmy winds up becoming pretty big himself. Blackie moved to upstate New York in 1960, right before the band happened in New York City. The significance of these two shops is staggering. Both men playing a pivotal role in the New York City tattoo scene. The next artist we're gonna move on to is Crazy Eddie, Eddie Funk, Philadelphia Eddie, the man of many names. There's no secret that he holds a special place in my heart. He's my local legend, and he was a legend, period. He's also somebody on this list that I actually got to meet at one time. To me, this makes it even more special. In 1952, when Eddie was 15 or 16 years old, his family took him on vacation up to Coney Island, just like pretty much all the other people in New York City or Long Island or the immediate area would do. He had an uncle that was tattooed and he always admired tattoos. Eddie couldn't wait to get his own tattoos. So he sees a shop while he's walking in Coney Island and there's a sign on the door that says, expert tattooing. He walked into the tattoo shop of Max Pels and he waited his turn. He got his first tattoo off of Max. It was a skull and crossbones on his arm. That tattoo not only started a journey that would lead him to fame and notoriety, but it also led him to a life he wanted to lead, a modern day pirate. Eddie always said that he thought he was a pirate in his previous life. Now here he was in Max Pels' shop, about to alter his life in ways he couldn't even imagine. Altered his life so quickly that after Eddie got the first tattoo done, he went, hung out with friends, and came back and got a rattlesnake done on his arm the same day. I can't even tell you how much this brings a smile to my face just hearing these stories about Eddie and his adventures of getting tattooed and starting in the business. Knowing what it's like to have that instant addiction to tattoos. I tell people all the time, tattoos are like potato chips, you can't just have one. After he wrapped up, he said to Max, hey, how can I learn how to do this? He told Eddie, for 300 bucks, I'll sell you a machine and teach you how to set it up. He then tells Eddie, you're gonna go home, you're gonna practice, and when you're good enough, you come back and maybe you can work in my shop with me. Now this is where the story gets great. Eddie goes down the street, robs a grocery store, gets the 300 bucks, and immediately comes back to Max's place and says, here you go, give me the stuff. Max then tells him, hey, you know what? Come back tomorrow, I have everything ready for you. Keep this in mind. This is all in the same day. Two tattoos, robbing a grocery store, grabbing the cash, getting the stuff you need to be a tattoo artist. Boom, done. We really have to do a full story on Eddie just to appreciate the amount of stories that this man has. I, it just It's crazy to me sitting here talking about him after hearing stories or seeing things about him throughout almost my whole adult life. Now Eddie would work for Max for a short time before he would actually go down the street and work down at Brooklyn Blackie's shop. At Blackie's shop, he would work alongside Tony the Pirate Cambria. Now Blackie would take the time to show Eddie where he was making mistakes, pull him off to the side, show him how to do better tattoos, and essentially make him a better tattooer. Now Blackie was also the one to dub Eddie as Crazy Eddie, and he wound up actually tattooing it on his arm. Now during his time working on Coney Island, he would go on to meet Dominic Chance, Lou Rubino, 
Jack Dracula. He even had an opportunity one time to meet Charlie Wagner. He knew the Moskowitz brothers and a slew of other tattoo artists from the time period. But for the sake of keeping this to just Coney Island, we're gonna stop Eddie's story there. And again, we're gonna have to continue that at another time. It's an amazing story. Hopefully we get to do that episode for you guys. Look for it. Up next, we're gonna talk about the tattoo artist, Tony the Pirate Cambria. Originally, he was taught how to tattoo by Sailor Ralph, who was in the Bowery at the time. Ralph just happened to move to Brooklyn around the same time that he actually took Tony the Pirate Cambria under his wings to teach him how to better tattoo. He started to tattoo professionally at 15 or 16 years old with Brooklyn Blackie. Tony said he only took the job at Blackie's to have a little bit of money to get a lawyer to keep him out of jail. He really didn't want to make money off of tattoos. Now Blackie knew that Tony had artistic skills. So he makes Tony sign a contract making him say that he wouldn't open up a tattoo shop or that he would work for Brooklyn Blackie for a certain amount of time. After he signs the contract, Brooklyn Blackie takes him under his wing and starts to teach him how to tattoo professionally. Now Tony would work for Brooklyn Blackie for a couple of years and it was said during that time frame they would tattoo up to 200 guys a day. Tony would say that he'd get there at the shop in the morning and there'd be guys sleeping out in front of the shop waiting to get tattooed. That's how busy Brooklyn Blackie's shop was. Crazy. Now after Coney Island, Tony the Pirate Cambria would team up with other artists and move to different shops throughout the area. And he would stay in New York City until around 1960 when the ban happens. At that point, he ends up going across the bridge into New Jersey. So the next artist on my list is Coney Island Freddy. You gotta include him, right? His name's got Coney Island in it. What the hell, right? Now Freddy dabbled in tattoos as a young kid giving himself his first tattoo when he was around 13 years old, right around the time his mom passed away. He actually winds up tattooing mom on his forearm. It wasn't until 1956 that he would actually get out of the Air Force and start to tattoo professionally. He purchased his first machine off the Greco Brothers, and then he winds up opening up a shop down on Mermaid Ave. It's been said that Coney Island Freddy was one of those guys that held on to the traditions of tattooing until the very end. And he handed those traditions down to his nephew, Mike Perfetto. Now Mike Perfetto also winds up becoming a legend basically within the New York City tattoo scene. I want to say that he's pretty much a legend worldwide at this point. I wasn't able to get a lot of information on Coney Island Freddy, but I want to assure you guys that he's not here as a footnote to this story. He is here for a reason. Not only was he a fantastic tattoo artist that was a pretty big person in the scene of the Coney Island era, he's also a major player in the band for New York City. He had the balls to stand up to New York City when they tried to do this band. When they started to close up shops, one by one, shops started to disappear. Him and Eddie Funk decided to get a lawyer and try to take the city and the Board of Health to court. These guys weren't going down without a fight. You were taking money out of their pocket. Not gonna happen. Now there's many, many stories about why this happened, long tales, rumors. If you know about the band, I'm sure you've actually heard some of these stories. But the official word on the document from Fred Grossman, AKA Coney Island Freddy, versus Leona Bumgarner lists the main reason as a hepatitis outbreak. In this document, we're gonna go over a couple quick sentences that I highlighted that actually give a little bit more backstory for the official word of the band. I'll actually put it up on the screen as well. The first one here is, in section 181.15 recites that, shall be unlawful for any person to tattoo a human being except for medical purposes by one licensed to practice medicine. Really? I don't really think I off the top of my head anybody that can tattoo medically or what the reasoning would be rather another piece here is at the time of the trial the plaintiff Grossman was a laborer the plaintiff Funk a roofer the former testified in detail about the manner of which he had operated its his tattooing parlor six days a week all year around from noon to midnight in compliance with the then applicable rules of the Board of Health. 
He noted he used a sterilizer and sterilized the dyes which were employed in Pyrex baby bottles. He admitted that he wore no gloves and that tattooing at times resulted in some bleeding. Now, there are stories about guys that, you know, had autoclaves in their shop and they had mounds of dust on top of them and they didn't know how to use them or the health inspectors would ask him to operate them and they didn't even know how to turn them on. There's even one story that there was a tattoo artist that was steaming clams in the autoclave. I mean, I, I could see, you know, that being a problem, right? The next paragraph is where this really kind of sums it up as far as the state and the Board of Health were concerned. The evidence offered on behalf of the defendant strongly supported the conclusion that there was a connection between tattooing and serum hepatitis, that those tattooed, despite all precautions taken by the tattooer, were subjected to a far greater risk of contracting hepatitis than those not tattooed. There are other pieces of this and we're gonna talk about them real quick. The next one is gonna talk about there was a death that happened and from what I've been told, no one has ever been able to prove that somebody died from hepatitis that they got from a tattoo shop. Testified that in 1959, several cases of hepatitis, one resulting in death, had been traced to tattooing. Although the health authorities initially believed that it would be possible to adopt stringent regulations which would permit tattooing without danger to the public, supervision of the tattoo parlors to assure proper sterilization was found to be a practical impossibility and dangerous and unsanitary conditions to prevail. So basically what they're saying is that there was no way they would be able to go to all the tattoo shops and make sure that these guys were using the autoclaves and doing what they were supposed to do, which we all know today in the year 2024 was complete BS. So these last two pieces, I think were the, the, the linchpin for the whole case. Now this piece right here that I'm actually reading you guys is their appeal to the appellate court to stop them from shutting down tattooing in New York City. The director of Health Department's Bureau of Preventable Disease also testified that there was a direct casual connection between tattooing and the disease. It was his opinion based on statistical analysis, which is complete bullshit. There was nothing to prove that these guys were the reason there was an outbreak of hepatitis in New York City. The last part that I have that's highlighted is agreed that tattooing was a health hazard that could be controlled only by prohibition. So basically what they're saying is there were no rules that they could lay out, it just had to be gone. Now, there's stories that I've heard that actually intertwine with a bunch of other stories that New York City essentially wanted to get rid of tattooing because the 1964 World's Fair was coming and the rich snooty bastards of New York City thought, oh, well, we can't have people walking around all tattooed up in our city while the world looks at us. Complete bullshit. Now, the ban did last from 1961 until 1997 when Rudy Giuliani decided to overturn the ban and bring tattooing back into New York City. Now, that ban may have lasted that long, but that doesn't mean tattooing stopped in New York City. We know a lot of well-known tattoo artists that came out of this, the city during those banned years. Hell, Coney Island Freddy didn't even stop tattooing and his name was on the docket. These guys went underground as soon as this ban went into place. There were essentially, from what I understand, eight to 10 tattoo shops that were running during the banned years. Hell, there could have been more. Nobody was keeping track of them. But you know what? That's gonna have to be a tale for another time. If you want more tattoo history, make sure you check out our other videos that we've already done, and make sure you like and subscribe for future tattoo history that I plan on doing in the real near future. This is something I love. I love the history of tattooing, and I'm gonna do my best to bring it to you. Have a good one, guys. See you on the flip side.